Our Christian liturgical traditions have two high holy days, with seasons of preparation before and reflection afterward. Lent prepares us for the resurrection at Easter, which is followed by 49 more days of celebration and reflection, crowned by the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This is followed by a long season of ordinary discipleship time, learning and growing in faith. Advent prepares us for the Incarnation at Christmas, which is followed by just 12 days of celebration, crowned by the visitation of the Magi at Epiphany. And then we are given a season of reflection afterwards, between four and nine weeks long, to take us to Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent again. The feast day of Epiphany is January 6th, but I wanted the opportunity to commemorate it with you, so I saved it for today. And when I watched the news on January 6th, on the actual day of Epiphany, and saw what was happening in Washington, D.C., as well as at state capitals around the U.S., and even here in Canada in a few cities, I knew I had to tell the Epiphany story. Epiphany is not usually celebrated in our wider communities. The Magi are kind of stuffed into the nativity set and introduced as three extra characters who arrived on Christmas Eve and jostle with the shepherds for room in the stable. The nativity stories from Luke and Matthew get smushed together and so we find Christmas cards that show shepherds looking up at stars or angels hovering over stables that have shepherds, wise men, animals, the holy family, and occasionally a little drummer boy all standing side by side. And there's really no harm in that. But as practicing Christians, we are blessed when we can experience Luke and Matthew separately and sink into each story and see what God reveals to us. And when we do read Matthew's story, we usually end the story with the Magi went home by another road, <clears throat> which is really a great beginning for a sermon. I love to talk about how the Magi are the outsiders in terms of culture, religion, even language, and how God uses their interests, studying the stars, to share the good news of Jesus' birth with them. It is a demonstration of what God said to Abraham and Sarah long ago, that through them one day all nations would know God and be blessed. I love that Luke's story brings the shepherds, poor marginalized folk, to see Jesus. And Matthew's story brings these foreigners from another land to come and see. But while Luke's story has the social context of Ma Mary's family and her relationship with Elizabeth and the prophetic voices of both women culminating in that beautiful Magnificat, Matthew's story has the political context. Herod is the absolute ruler of the land and Jesus' birth is not at all good news for him. In Matthew's story, the Magi become unwitting snitches. They let Herod in on what is happening, not because they want to cause trouble, but because they see signs that a king is being born and assume that they will find the baby king in the capital, in Jerusalem. When Herod hears the news, the text says that he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. We know what that means. When the man with all the power is upset, everyone else gets upset pretty quickly. Some because they are also people in powerful positions and they don't want those systems of power to change. Others become upset because they are powerless and vulnerable. And bad things happen when the people who are in control of your life feel threatened. But luckily for us, the Magi are the heroes in Matthew's story. They are awake to the signs in the sky, the stars that God reveals to them. And then they are also awake to the warning they receive in their dreams to not return to the palace once they have seen the Holy Child. 
they become resistors, like the midwives in Egypt, siding on the side of life instead of the side of power. Their courage to try to get home before Herod notices is, if not illegal, at least not very diplomatic. But these magi are open to revelation and they listen to what is revealed to them. And that is where the story often ends. The magi leave and we breathe a sigh of relief. But Matthew goes on with his story. King Herod discovers that the Magi have not returned to report to him, and he flies into a rage. He gives an order for his military to seek out all male children under the age of two around Bethlehem and kill them. Not question their families or try to determine which child is the right one, just kill them all. It is an act of terror, and rightfully called the slaughter of the innocents. It reminds us of another king, a pharaoh of long ago, who also tried to kill baby boys to stop the Israelites from growing too numerous and threatening his power. In Matthew's story, Jesus is the new Moses, kept safe somehow despite the despotic ruler's death wish. Moses is floated down the river in a basket. Jesus' parents are warned in a dream and travel by night, seeking refuge in Egypt, escaping murder by crossing a border. They stay in Egypt until Herod dies and it is safe for return, but Joseph hasn't heard great things about Herod's successor, so they head for the backwater district of Galilee, hoping to stay under the radar. And so Jesus is allowed to grow up. The Epiphany story should shock us, it should remind us that there is danger and evil in the world and that siding with God can be dangerous work. It should also remind us that we need to be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves, as it says in Matthew 10, 16. Using both our brains and our hearts to judge the people and situations we come across. Despite our Bible stories and traditions that warn us about the systems of power that oppress and take advantage of the vulnerable, Christians can be drawn into those same systems. Religion can be used to hurt. Sometimes it seems more often than it is used to heal. God's name has been invoked as a justification for war, for forced conversions, for killing those who don't believe the same thing that we do. For hate. There's a famous quote of unknown origin that says, when fascism comes to America, it will come cloaked in a flag and bearing a cross. That means that both patriotism and faith can be twisted into a means to seize power and to keep others under control. We saw ample evidence of both on January 6th. I don't know how much of the media coverage you watched, but there were giant crosses erected outside the Capitol building as it was being attacked. And one person carried a Jesus Saves banner as he entered the building illegally. Another sign said, God, guns, and guts made America. Let's keep all three. A gallows was also built outside with a noose tied and ready. Armed rioters scaled walls and broke windows and chased an officer up several flights of stairs before he could find backup. It was a scene of chaos that was constantly bordering on violence. Five people ended up dead, including one police officer. And lest we pat ourselves on the back too hard, apparently it was a Canadian, a man from Calgary, who carried a Confederate flag into the Capitol, something that has never happened in the history of that building. In Toronto and Vancouver, there were small demonstrations from Canadian Trump supporters saying, stop the steal, repeating the lie that the election was fraudulent. It's left me with so many questions. 
how can we respond to seeing a cross and a gallows both erected in a public place? How do we reconcile our understanding of faith to see a Confederate flag beside a banner for Jesus? What is our faithful response to extremism? And how do we actively create peace and not allow anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, and other evils gain acceptance in our communities? It seems clear to me that it is not enough that we ourselves refrain from harming others. We have to work to build homes and communities and countries that are safe places. If we lived in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, would we ignore Herod's military action, secure that our own children were too old to be targeted? Or would we listen to Rachel weeping for her children and take action in solidarity with our neighbors? I confess that it is too tempting, especially for those of us whose children and grandchildren are safe, to ignore the cries of our neighbors or to justify what has happened to others as somehow their fault or want to sweep it away as that all happened in the past. There are already calls for healing and unity from those who want to deny the part they played in the riots in the US. Already, four days later. But as followers of Jesus, we must side with the vulnerable. We must listen to their stories and try to see the world through their eyes and not through our own comfortable lenses. As long as Black, Indigenous, and people of color continue to be disproportionately harmed, we have to stand with them. As long as a disproportionate number of LGBTIQ2S youth seek to end their lives, we have to stand with them. And as long as refugees seeking safety for themselves and their children are rejected or jailed, we have to stand with them. Because when we do, we demonstrate that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And when we do, God will be with us. Thanks be to God. I invite you to sing with me, In the Darkness Shines the Splendor, Voices United, number 92.